We good? Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Donna Chow, your host and your moderator for today's class. Today's webinar is being presented by Lotus Institute of Integrative Medicine. We are popularly known as eLotus and have been hosting educational courses for over 20 years. We are proud to be your trusted source for premium CEU content. Wow, so what a time we are living in today here at eLotus. We want you to know that our safety is our top priority and during this coronavirus pandemic, we have taken preventative measures to, for keeping our speakers, attendees, and staff as safe as possible. To that end, we have asked Anthony to present this weekend's class remotely from his home. So this is the very first time we'll be having something like this and asking the speaker to present remotely for a full day's class. So we want to thank all of you in advance for your patience and understanding as we navigate through this new reality. Please know that if you are here to earn CEUs and there is a dropout in connection for any reason um, on our end or on the speaker end, your CEUs are safe. They will not be affected. Again, thank you guys so much for being here today from all over the world. It's great that although some of us might be on a lockdown, we can still have a cyber social gathering. Um, just out of curiosity, please let me know where you are watching from today's class. Go ahead and type it into the chat room. Okay, so we have people all over California, Denver, Montana, Arizona. I did see someone from Italy register, so uh, thank goodness you're at home anyway, so thank you for joining us. India, wow. The Caribbean Netherlands. A lot of places. So again, thank you guys for joining us and choosing eLotus for your continuing education needs. So now a second question for you out of curiosity. How many of you are familiar with myofascial trigger point acupuncture? If so, type yes into the, cat, into the chat room. Okay, so it looks like a majority of people are familiar with it, and there are some newbies here, but don't worry, you're going to be like me. I, um, I've heard of it. I've actually learned it from David, David Legg. He was one of our speakers here. But So I guess, yes, then I have learned it. I learned it from David. So it's great to learn from more people because then it, it kind of uh, solidifies my learning and it adds more information to my, my learning bank, my knowledge bank. <laughs> Okay, so if this is your first class with Anthony Vondermal, type first into the chat room. We just want to get an idea of who our attendees are today. Perfect. Look, Anthony, we have new friends for you. <laughs> yes. yes. All right. Well, I see some so today's names. class is the complete guide to myofascial trigger point acupuncture with Andy Anthony Vondermal, and this webinar is being recorded. Before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. We are scheduled to end at 6 p.m. Pacific time today. Lunch is 1 to 2 p.m. and we'll have two breaks in the morning and two in the afternoon. Now let me give you an overview of our webinar room. To the right of the video feed, you will find the PowerPoint for today's class. A copy of these slides can be found in a PDF version from the course access page. You can choose to download six slides to a page or two slides. It's up to you. And we made the images in color for you. Under the video feed, you will find the chat room. And here, you, you are welcome to con connect with your colleagues who are also attending today's class live. For any side chatter, feel free to private chat. You can do this by clicking on the menu icon at the top right-hand corner of the chat room. This menu icon looks like a bunch of horizontal lines with an upside down triangle. If you have any questions regarding your account or technical issues, please feel free to start a private chat with the host. If you have a question for our speaker, please type it directly into the public chat room. He will be able to see it when he's presenting, but do keep in mind that when he's presenting, he may not be answering all the questions because the, the focus is on the lecture. He may have a designated time for Q&A. So please do keep your questions related to the topic he is currently presenting. 
All right, so we have three groups joining us today. The first group is our Watch It Free group. You have registered for today's webinar using a coupon code to gain free access to today's live event only. If you would like to earn CEUs or receive access to the four-week video replay, you can upgrade to our second group, which is our paid group. Paid attendees receive CU credit and can re-watch the contents of today's class for as many times as they like for a whole month. This class is packed with a lot of great information, so to fully absorb today's information, it's always a good idea to re-watch the important parts. And finally, our third group is our Gold Pass members. Gold Pass members have unlimited access to all of our online courses of over 3,000 hours of video and includes live webinars like today's class. Gold Pass members can access any of our English courses for as long as you are a member. Plus, you receive special perks for our industry sponsors. And speaking of sponsors today, I'd like to thank Evergreen Herbs as well as their customers. Because of you, we are able to host special promotional events such as today's class. When you choose Evergreen as your, ever, as your herbal provider, you're also choosing to invest in the advancement of TCMs. Thank you so much again for your support. All right, let's get started with today's class on myofascial trigger point acupuncture with Anthony Vondermal. Anthony specializes in sports, orthopedic, and neuromuscular injuries and pain conditions. He has over 15 years of clinical experience as a sports massage therapist, physical therapy aide, athletic training assistant, and licensed acupuncturist in multidisciplinary clinics, including Spine Med Associates and the Prime Pain Medical Institute. All right. Let's go ahead and give a big welcome to Anthony. And Anthony, let's do one last testing on your end so we make sure we hear you. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. And thank you so much to eLotus for hosting this webinar um, and going ahead with it despite these various challenges and trying times. And I, uh, I want to give uh, special thanks and credit to them also for being uh, among the uh, acupuncture and oriental medicine educational associations and organizations, the first that I'm aware of that actually recognize the seriousness of the, uh, the coronavirus epidemic. My wife and I were visiting family in Israel two weeks ago when I got an email from Elota saying, we're going to um, cancel the in-person part of this webinar. We still want you to come down and present in the studio. And that was the first I heard. It's like, okay, wow, this is really serious if even a group of 10 attendees is perceived to be too risky. And I think they're absolutely right in making that judgment call early on. Um, and then this last week, uh, we determined between, between us that it was unsafe for me to even fly down to the uh, to City of Industry uh, for the studios at eLotus. So that's why, welcome to my living room. I, and I, the second person I really want to give special thanks to is my wife, Tamara Brown, who herself an acupuncturist who generously agreed to our, our home being a studio for this weekend's classes and uh, put in some extra hours cleaning it up and making it nice and tidy and well organized. Um, and I want you all please to all bear with me as we do a little bit of improvisation in terms of how to make this work uh, with um, uh, attempted demonstration of very hands-on physical medicine in a remote setting. But this is, as I'm sure, uh, as Donna said very eloquently, this is the new reality that we're all facing and for, for a little while here and we don't know how long. So. Um, and the third group of people I really want to thank are some of my students and uh, um, uh, colleagues in the doctor program of the, acupunct the Doctorate of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine program at the Academy of Chinese Culture and Health Sciences in Oakland, California, uh, who have just stepped up at the last minute to help me with the logistics of this weekend and with being demonstration patients. And uh, Jason Salem is here with me in the room, and he'll be helping uh, as camera person. And we have. Um, a series of uh, students who are going to come in for demonstration treatment as well. Um, and so I have to turn Siri off here. She thinks I'm talking to her, but not today. Um, and, uh, and then fourth, I want to thank the teachers who taught me these techniques that I'm going to share with you. And, and I will be going through them sort of sequentially as I introduce aspects and elements of, the te of these techniques over the weekend. Um, so the, this, uh, today's class, uh, on myofascial trigger point acupuncture will be followed by a class tomorrow on what, what I call ligamentous uh, proloacupuncture, which is a shorthand for proliferative, proliferative therapy, uh, using a needle to proliferate cell growth and tissue hypertrophy to restabilize unstable joints. Um, 
And between these two classes, um, uh, I just want to put them in just a sort of a larger context. They are both um, uh, methods of local needling. Um, and let's see, I'm going to start scrolling through a few slides here so that you get a sense of what you're going to get out of both today and the, and the weekend as a whole if you're able to attend tomorrow as well. Um, so uh, we're going to be identifying some of the commonalities and differences between um, acupuncture traditions that we might have learned in a master's program uh, or a doctor program, uh, classical ac acupuncture, modern TCM, etc., and myofascial trigger point needling today and tomorrow ligamentous proacupuncture. Um, we're going to talk about what uh, licensed acupuncturists may have to learn and may have to gain from studying and practicing these techniques. Uh, we'll uh, review some of the history and physical exam findings that indicate that these techniques would be particularly useful. Um, and we're going to uh, review some safety training uh, and uh, some of the side effects, uh, contraindications, cautions, patient educations, and informed consent, all of which are very important. Uh, most of it is very similar to acupuncture, but there's a few additional things that we need to highlight. Um, and then some um, methods for learning these techniques, um, which are inherently hands-on, but I'm going to communicate as best I can via distance learning. And, and then uh, my lowest priority, but if we have time, we'll get to it, is some discussion of the the east-west anatomy and physiology of myofascial trigger points um, and, and joint injuries, which is a lot of overlap between east and west, but each have their unique perspectives to add to a complete picture of how to treat these very common and significant, clinically significant injuries. Okay, So I want to thank you all for being here. Um, and um, I'm seeing many familiar names in the lineup and many that I have uh, not had the pleasure of meeting yet. And um, with that general introduction, I'm going to going to start going through some of our material here. Um, I do need to, however, just grab a different pair of glasses than I thought I would, would work for this because my own slides are slightly too fine uh, point size. So with an apology, I will be right back in just a couple seconds here. Okay, that's a lot better for me. So, um, so uh, why, how did I come to this particular style of acupuncture? It's not the only one that I use. I want to be uh, clear about that uh, right now and up front, that I use distal acupuncture all the time. Um, I, I don't keep statistics, but impressionistically, I would say maybe a third to half of my treatments in the clinic uh, use some form of distal acupuncture. I use Richard Tan's balance method very frequently. I had the pleasure of studying with him a number of years ago, and that's been a mainstay of my practice. I use the TCM that I learned at school, including things like the eight extra meridians, and uh, I use some master dong points, although I don't uh, haven't delved into that nearly as much. Um, but uh, there is a lot of um, uh, synergy between using the, those distal techniques and local techniques. Um, but what we're going to focus on this weekend is the local uh, and the myofascial trigger point and the ligamentous proloacupuncture. Okay. So uh, just a little background for me. I graduated from the Five Branches University in California uh, in 2003 or 2002 and was licensed the following year in 2003 and began my clinical practice, focusing pretty much right from the beginning on orthopedics, sports, pain management, um, and my first big educational venture right out of acupuncture school was completing the 300-hour National Board Certification Program in Acupuncture Orthopedics that was taught by uh, Dr. Fred Lerner, himself a chiropractor, with some other acupuncturists and, uh, and Western physicians participating in the NBAO program. I know there's a few of you on the list here who are NBA, NBAO diplomats, and it was a great program, which unfortunately has kind of lapsed as an entire generation of instructors has retired. But um, uh, that was mostly Western orthopedics. Um, and then my journey since then has been to kind of integrate the Western and Eastern. And so what I, I hope and think you will get out of this weekend is, is a blend, is an integration. Um, uh, yes, you can go take, as I did, uh, seminars from physical therapists if you're interested, or, or, or from acupuncturists who uh, teach and use exclusively myofascial 
trigger point needling, but I'm going to I'm going to talk about integration of these this weekend. Okay, um, and I. Um, the, the myofascial trigger point needling techniques, I would say, I dabbled in for a number of years. I um, actually was kind of turned off to them for a, for a while by myself serving as a demonstration patient in a continuing education seminar. This is over 15 years ago, uh, where I found it to be very painful and uncomfortable. It was, it was a lot of deep needling into my gluteals, and I was stiff and sore for a couple of days. And the, the, it wasn't that there was anything wrong with the technique, but the context I was not uh, given uh, uh, as uh, complete a um, understanding of what was being done and why and what I should expect as would have been really helpful. Um, and so I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on that. The difference between having a patient say, ow, that hurts, what did you do? You know, and thinking that you're incompetent or, or clumsy or you don't care, or you're callous, versus a patient embracing it and going, okay, this is going to be like deep tissue massage. or or running a marathon, or a really hot sauna, where part of the challenge and part of the benefit is for the patient to separate themselves from their emotional reaction to an uncomfortable sensa sensation and endure something that is actually very powerfully therapeutic for them. Um, and with that approach and with that understanding, I find that even patients who, when they first show up in my clinic, say, I only want you to use serins, and um, I only want you to do distal needling, and okay, sure, that's fine, we'll try that. And sometimes it works great. If it does, we keep going. If it doesn't, well, would you be open to trying something that may have a stronger sensation up front, but may also have a longer lasting benefit for you? Um, and in many cases, it's not for everyone, but I do find most patients, when properly educated and put in a proper context, uh, will embrace this and benefit from it greatly. But as I say, I kind of dabbled in it somewhat uh, after my own uncomfortable experience. But I thought, well, you know, I'm going to pick up the Travell and Simmons manuals and try to self-teach myself some because I've heard good things about this. And, you know, some people say it really works. And I'm just going to tell you, that's not a good way to learn this. Um, Travell and Simmons manuals are great. There's a ton of information in them. Um, but they were um, written for physicians doing injection therapy and um, and and even in that context, needed a lot of hands-on training. Um, so uh, there are some, uh, if you just pick up the myofascial trigger point manual books, and, and as I did, look for the X's and needle into the X's and go, oh, great, this is just another set of acupuncture points, and you know, try to memorize where the X's are and find them on patients. Uh, well, the, the latest edition of the Travell and Simmons manual, uh, now published some, I guess, almost 45 years later, um, the third edition, they've taken out the X's because those have not stood up well to the test of time and, uh, and, and further research. So, you, so here's the good news. You don't need to memorize a whole other set of acupuncture points in order to make this work. Um, but what is really useful is the trigger point charts themselves and the referred pain patterns and an understanding of how to make the needling technique work. So that's where we're going to spend our time. Okay. Um, so, um, what really got my attention and, uh, and made me want to study this uh, more in depth as a technique and really start to try to master it was actually one of my students. Um, since 2005, I served as a clinical supervisor at the Five Branches University. And one of my acupuncture students, we were treating her in clinic for, she was a runner and she had some kind of chronic patellofemoral pain and quadriceps tightness. And I and my students did our usual stuff. We did you know, a bunch of gua sha, some stretching, um, some kneeling into classical acupuncture points and hooking it up to Easton. And she wasn't really getting any better. And then she went to see a, a, another clinic supervisor who was a physician who had been trained and licensed in Europe but was practicing under an acupuncture license in this country. And her main modality was this myofascial trigger point needling. And, and my student came back and said, well, I had one treatment. And I mean, this is six months later. She said, it's been gone for six months. I was like, wow. Hmm. That got my attention. This is one of my own acupuncture students telling me that this worked much better than what I've been doing. So I thought, OK, I've got something to learn here. Um, now, not everyone responds that way. Um, but I've had enough responses, really good responses like that, since I really you know, began to learn and practice this technique. But what I decided to do was, um, this was at the same time, I might add, somewhere around 2014, 2015, where 
where there was this sudden explosion of interest in myofascial trigger point needling all around the country with physical therapists and chiropractors in many states getting licensed. And I understand many of you are practicing in states where this uh, may be a real threat to your practice. Um, and I could see that coming to California. It hasn't come, come here yet, um, but it is on its way. Um, and so I thought if I can't necessarily, if I can't beat them, if we can't beat them as a professional association and, and uh, you know, hold back the tide of very well-organized, very well-funded physical therapists, I at least want to join them. I at least want to know what they're doing and be able to do what they're doing. And, and I was starting to get phone calls from patients who are moving to California from out of state saying, hey, do you do dry needling? Do you do trigger point needling? Um, because I had that and it really worked for me. So I want to be able to say yes. But I want to be able to say with integrity and honesty and not just say, oh, yeah, it's exactly the same thing as acupuncture that I learned in the master's program, because it's not. Uh, I want to be quite frank about that. They are, they are quite different. Um, and there is a larger conversation about the source and whether there's cultural piracy involved. And there are arguments on both sides. And I, I, I want to sidestep that argument for this weekend, because it's too subtle and it's too complex and it doesn't really add to our clinical skills. But I, I think there, are, there is a good case to be made that these techniques were practiced in ancient China. And they also evolved, whether it was parallel evolution or whether it was taken from China. I, I'm not going to weigh in on that. I don't know enough of the history of that. And, I, and it began in the West. Back, we can trace it back to the 1600s, long enough ago that there aren't very clear historical records on either side for us to, to say anything definitive about this. So with my apology and uh, for sidestepping this emotionally charged question, I want to stay focused on the, the clinical practical issues here and say that what is being taught and practiced by physical therapists as myofascial trigger point needling is quite different than how I learned acupuncture in Chinese medicine school. But, but as I said, it, there's some benefits to it. So, so I decided I was going to go through the, myo, the Myopain Seminars 90-hour dry needling program starting in 2016. And I finished it and was certified. Um, and I walked in there with kind of a swagger my first day thinking, yeah, I've been practicing acupuncture for 15 years. What, I'm gonna, what am I going to learn from these physical therapists? I'm still curious. I'm here, but, you know, I kind of know how to handle a needle and everything I need to know here. Um, and within the first hour, I was like, okay, I'm going to spend the rest of this weekend eating humble pie because there was a lot that I had to learn. Um, and what physical therapists do know extremely, extremely well, better than physicians, most physicians, is musculoskeletal anatomy. They know how to find muscles with palpatory skills. They know what those muscles do. They know how they work together in, in kinematic chains to produce motion. Um, they know the, the, the neurovascular anatomy that is important to know when you're doing deep, strong needling. Okay? So I had a lot to learn, and I did learn it. And it was a rigorous exam with a practical and written component. And there was a lot of emphasis on safety. Now, Myopain Seminars is the oldest and the best and the gold standard for this modality, which is why I went to them. And I know that there are some other um, training programs out there that seem to be fairly reckless um, and casual about safety. And that's where some of the, the pneumothorax uh, injuries and other you know, horror stories that people have heard about really painful needling, et cetera, probably come out of inadequate training and inadequate uh, supervision. Okay? So, but since that time, I have been using this as a, a, a big part of my practice. Um, and so let's, uh, so here, here's the stuff that I think is really important for us as traditionally trained acupuncturists, where depending on your background, depending on the school you went to, what other training and experience you may have had, et cetera, you may con consider that you may really need from a benefit uh, from some additional training in these areas. As I mentioned, knowing your deep intramuscular neurovascular anatomy. Um, there are a few muscles where that's really critical. Um, and then in order to make it work, um, being able to, to uh, identify muscles by palpation, um, sometimes manually test them for their function, um, know what they, what they do and what they don't do, um, and how to differentiate them from adjacent tissues of other types. Um, the history, the symptoms that indicate specifically that myofascial trigger points are present and need to be reduced through trigger point needling. Um, physical exam findings uh, to find and assess myofascial trigger points, um, including most of all uh, the palpatory skills. Uh, and we'll go over that in more detail very shortly here. 
and also manual strength testing is kind of the supplementary technique for identifying the likely presence of myofascial trigger points. And then finally, as I said, um, some additional conversation about um, patient education, informed consent, our bedside manner regarding administering an uncomfortable treatment. Um, now, there is a lot of variety within our profession and in within the dry needling world on how strongly to needle, how to do this, how much discomfort is acceptable, tolerable, etc. Um, and so my personal choice and, and uh, clinical approach is to try to match my technique with where the patient is at in terms of their two things, their tolerance for discomfort and also their goals for treatment. Okay? Um, and I, uh, I prefer a more flexible approach where some patients need very minimal trigger point needling, uh, very light sensation, um, thinner gauge needles, uh, fewer twitch responses, less time needling into them. Some patients are tolerant and willing and really have a goal in mind of rapid recovery and want strong, deep, uh, uh, powerful needling. So I can do both. And we should be able to do both. That's my, my view. Um, but <clears throat> um, if there's a, a, a tendency within acupuncture, at least as it's taught and practiced in the West, to, to minimize and downplay the pain. We want to deliver painless acupuncture. We want to use painless needles, painless technique. And that has some benefits for patients that are really needle phobic and anxiety phobic. I mean, uh, have high level of anxiety about needles and uh, pain phobic. Um, but there's some drawbacks to that too that, that we need to talk about. And so my, my deep underlying goal, whether I'm using myofascial trigger point needling or whether I'm using strong needling with master dong points or distal acupuncture or ligamentous pearl acupuncture or seven star needling, gua sha, cupping, whatever it is, is my underlying goal is I want to help the patient recover their own ability to manage pain. Uh, and to, to build some firewalls for them in between pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience and their function in daily life. So that when they have pain, it doesn't wrap them up and paralyze them emotionally and physically. And likewise, when they have a stressful day at work, when they uh, have a stressful day in our stressful society, that it doesn't bleed over into physical pain. And so really by administering an uncomfortable uh, treatment in a therapeutic context, we can really help and facilitate that process of patients recovering what is basically a biologically uh, built-in capacity to endure discomfort and continue functioning anyway. Okay, so, so um, to, to get a little more specific about, you know, what are, what are we actually talking about with with myofascial trigger points. Um, the definition of a myofascial trigger point is a tender node in taut fibrous band of muscle that refers pain elsewhere when stimulated or compressed. Okay, So that's got some overlap with, but it is not the same as um, uh, classical acupuncture points, which many of which are myofascial, which are frequently turn out to be myofascial trigger points and vice versa. But they're not identical. There's overlap, but they're not identical. They're not the same as motor points either. Motor points are where the, the motor neuron enters, the, the main motor neuron that makes a muscle function enters that muscle belly uh, and is a site that shows increased electrical activity. Sometimes those can also become myofascial trigger points. Sometimes they aren't. There are myofascial trigger points that aren't motor points. Okay? So they're not uh, identical either, but there's some overlap. Um, but they are a lot more than simply a tender area. Okay? Squeeze LI4 or liver 3 on most people, they will report that it's tender. Doesn't mean it's a myofascial trigger point, okay? Um, because uh, if it's, so again, what we're looking for is that tender node, uh, what a patient will often describe as a knot, um, uh, a granulated or fibrous uh, uh, lump in a taut fibrous band of muscle tissue that when you push on it, the patient will exper experience more widespread pain rather than just local tenderness. That does have an awful lot of overlap, I believe, with the correct, with a proper interpretation or understanding of what asher means, which is not just tenderness. Asher is best translated as that's it. I found it. I found the key location that when I press on it, it reproduces the patient's typical symptoms, and that's really what the bullseye of what we're looking for with myofascial trigger points as well. Okay. <clears throat> 
So they do play a significant role in symptoms and disability. Um, the musculoskeletal system consumes is about 80% of the body weight and consumes about 80% of its caloric resources, more or less. Um, and so what goes on in our muscles affects everything else very significantly. And they have the orphan child, the orphan stepchild of, uh, of Western medicine. There's no profession of, there's no board specialty of myology that devotes itself specifically to muscles. And <clears throat> um, in my master's level training, they were kind of given short shrift as well. We spent maybe an hour or two on the the uh, <clears throat> the Jing Jin, the sinew meridians or sinew um, or sinew channels, as they were translated in the textbooks that we used, um, we got a little bit of instruction, but not much. Okay, and yet they are almost ubiquitous. Basically, any adult uh, is going to have a number of myofascial trigger points. They start forming basically with upright posture. Even children have myofascial trigger points, um, and they become more and more chronic and more significant and more disabling with age unless we treat them. Um, so there are primary myofascial trigger points that, that <clears throat> come into being on their own from muscle overloading and also psychosocial stress. Um, and then there are also secondary trigger points that form as a result of uh, injuries uh, to our joints, to our nervous system, to our organs, or, or to diseases of various sorts. Okay. Um, and what can ha either way, what happens with myofascial trigger form uh, trigger points once they become formed uh, is they start to bombard our central nervous system with pain signals, and that can lower pain thresholds and lower pain tolerance globally, so that a very painful myofascial trigger point in someone's quadriceps can make them start feeling what would otherwise be mild or latent or you know not troublesome sensations elsewhere in their body. Okay. They are often underdiagnosed and undertreated and may, mis may, may be mistaken for other conditions, uh, sprain strains, bursitis, arthritis, tendonitis, neuritis, etc. Okay. So <clears throat> I think much of this I've already talked about, and I'm just going to add a few things here. They, they are a clinically significant subset of tender areas and muscles, um, and some of them really can only be accessed by effectively by needles. Um, there are some muscles, quadratus lumborum, very difficult to release manually, to do anything effective with hands alone or with gua sha or, or cupping, way too deep. And yet with a needle, we can safely and very effectively get into this very deep muscle in the low back and do a lot of good. And I've had uh, more than one patient who has, uh, you know, their MRIs look okay, the physicians can't find what's wrong, they shrug their shoulders, doesn't look like a disc injury or a facet joint problem or spinal stenosis or nerve damage but they've got severe unremitting low back pain and needling into the quadratus lumborum relieves it significantly. So, um, so some of the benefits that come out of myofascial trigger point needling for a patient is getting lasting muscle relaxation and relief of local pain um, and restored muscle length and strength and elasticity and function. Uh, improved blood flow. There are very interesting studies coming out of the myofascial trigger point world that can that are consistent with what we've known for thousands of years in Chinese medicine, that um, pain inhibits blood flow and, and inhibited blo blood flow causes pain. And when you reduce a trigger point effectively, blood starts to flow again. This is observable in ultrasound studies. Um, we get restored biomechanics, uh, improved joint function, um, improved efficiency and comfort in posture, ergonomics, sports activities, et cetera. And, and then, as I said, a, a global re reduction in pain, or to put it differently, a global increase in, in, uh, in, in pain tolerance and pain threshold simply by reducing even a local myofascial trigger point. In the big picture, by reducing myofascial trigger points, we're moving qi and blood, both locally and globally. Okay. So one way of, of, that I like to, to, um, to look at this um, in terms of my, my own sort of experience of it um, uh, I, I love to backpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains near my home in uh, coastal California. And the analogy occurred to me that what I learned in acupuncture school was time-tested trails, well-established trails that get you, you can rely on them to get you where you want to go uh, most of the time with good results for many patients and conditions. They're relatively easy to follow and to teach and to learn and perform, etc. Um, but this is more for those of us that have been trained as acupuncturists, myofascial trigger point needling, we're going to be journeying cross country. And that can get us to unfamiliar destinations that we wouldn't otherwise see. 
uh, opens up new treatment options to treat conditions that weren't responding to, to um, traditional classical acupuncture techniques. But just like cross-country backpacking and going into the high country, there are some additional skills and safety training that we need uh, and some additional experience that we need to be able to, to perform it safely and get to where we want to go. Okay? Um, but we may already be doing it inadvertently. Um, and I certainly had this experience before I, I got sufficiently trained in myofascial trigger point needling, and many, maybe many of you have had too, where you were needling into a classical acupuncture point, and suddenly you got this really strong twitch or jump where the patient's muscle contracted. They may have yelped or you know, jumped off the table and, you know, and said, oh, I'll take that out. And I remember have, having one patient who got furious with me and was you know, accusing me of being incompetent and you know, stormed out of the clinic. And I mean, he had some other issues going on, but it was like, wow, okay, I, you know, I put a needle in large intestine 11 and did my little you know, uh, twirl manipulation and lift and thrust, and he got this enormous twitch response out of a, a huge trigger point that, in his forearm. And, and with adequate training, I would have been able to contextualize that for him and reframe it for him as like, wow, you've got a huge trigger point in your supinator or in your brachioradialis, and I just released it. That's great. This is therapeutic. I know it's super uncomfortable, and your arm is going to be store, sore and stiff and achy for maybe a day or two, but trust me, it's going to feel a lot better afterwards, and it's going to function better afterwards. This particular patient, I don't know if that would have made the difference, but that's what I do now with my patients. So you may, so if you've had that experience, it's not that you've done something wrong; it's that that you've needled into a trigger point, okay? Um, but and also, if you are selecting where to needle on the basis of muscular structure or function, uh, and needling into tender locations, you're doing trigger point needling. Um, so. The, this is the, the, the Nei Jing Ling Shu chapter 13, the very brief and only description we have of the classical treatment of the Jing Jin, the, the, the sinew tracts or the, the myofascial tracts as I prefer to call them. And I, uh, this is David Legge's translation, who as Donna Chow mentioned, he's an Australian uh, acupuncturist and physician who's been practicing musculoskeletal medicine since I was uh, in high school or something like that. And, uh, Apply rapid insertion and withdrawal of the heated needle and cease when puncturing begins to affect a cure irrespective of the period of treatment. Insert needles into tender aspects on the diseased area. Okay. So that sounds to me like a very succinct uh, classical description of myofascial trigger point needling. Um, so this probably does go back a very long way and I just want to you know, highlight that that actually cauterizing needles, uh, using heated needles to cauterize tissues outside our scope, but that's apparently part of what was done uh, with this technique originally. But um, So I do want to talk a little bit about translation here, and you just heard me use the term uh, myofascial tracts, which I think is a much better way to understand uh, what, what we're dealing with here. So um, meridians, uh, this is a, a term originally coined by the, the uh, French acupuncturist uh, Georges Soulier de Mohan back in the early 1900s. He was a bank clerk who just got interested, and he was working in Macau and got interested in Chinese medicine um, and did a number of translations of Chinese medical texts. He was not a practicing clinician. And he thought the best translation for Jingluo was meridian. Okay? But what meridian means in English is an imaginary semicircle on the Earth's surface reaching from the north to south pole or representation of a meridian on a map or a globe numbered according to degrees of longitude. I also don't particularly care for vessels, which means a large a ship or large boat or a shallow container used to hold a liquid or a bowl or um, uh, channels, a length of water wider than a strait joining two larger areas of water, especially two seas, or a band of frequencies used in radio and television transmission. Okay. None of those really captured for me. I don't know about you, but I think this term tracked describes much better what we're dealing with in a clinical context. A major passage in the body, a large bundle of nerve fibers or other continuous elongated anatomical structure or origin uh, that I'm just going to elide and you know, uh, blend these translations together. System of body parts or organs that act together to perform some function. Um, definite region of the body, especially a large group series or system of related parts or organs. I'm not a linguist. I, but I think that's a, that comes much closer 
uh, the word track to what we're actually dealing with uh, when we're practicing clinicians. Okay. Jin uh, is a complex ideograph made up of uh, rho, which means uh, flesh, including muscular tissue, li, tendons or physical strength and power, and ju, literally bamboo, right? We know that juru, um, used in, um, uh, as a, uh, uh, to describe segments that are connected by little joints, okay? The word sinew is a kind of an archaic literary term that doesn't include muscles, okay? Uh, and so I don't really like it that much for that reason. Um, and what I um, uh, prefer to use is the term myofascial. Um, so putting those together, myofascial tract is what I think we're really dealing with here. Okay. Um, so, excuse me one moment. Um, there's a lot of discrepancies um, that exist among various translations of the, of, you know, um, the Jing Jin. And similarly, in contemporary um, Western medicine, there's a lot of uh, anatomy and kinesiology studies that show controversies and variability in terms of how muscles um, function. And anatomic variation is the norm. I can tell you this from having spent time in cadaver labs where I've seen patients who have eight instead of six external rotators in their hip, who have muscles that attach to different locations and the textbooks say they're supposed to attach to. Uh, saw a patient uh, cadaver with a, a dorsopatrochlearis muscle on the back of their shoulder, which exists supposed to exist in knuckle walking primates, but not in humans. Okay, so we've got a lot of anatomic variation out there. Um, so in terms of translating studies, um, when treating pain and disability and function, um, uh, I'm going to put the emphasis on function and kinesiological analysis rather than over static anatomy, okay? Um, and muscle functions are multiple in most cases. There are very few muscles that have only one function. Um, and we're going to talk about the, their functions, whether they're contracted bilaterally or unilaterally, can change what a muscle does. Um, the quadratus lumborum that I mentioned earlier when contracting bilaterally exists, assists in maintenance of upright posture and extending the spine backwards or, or up to neutral from a forward bent position. But when it's, as is more commonly used, contracted unilaterally, it elevates the hip and brings it closer to the rib cage uh, and side bends the spine. Okay? There's also differences between whether muscles are used in an open chain fashion, such as waving my arm around uh, where there's nothing at the other end of my hand, versus whether I'm doing a push-up and that hand is planted on the ground, which would be a closed chain uh, motion. Okay? Whether the muscle is initiating a motion, which is a concentric contraction. I want to pick up a, a heavy object by, by flexing my biceps muscle and I initiate the motion to pick up the, the, the heavy box. Or maintaining a static length, which is an isometric contraction where I'm just holding the box in midair. Or a decelerating motion or eccentric contraction where I'm trying to slow down. Somebody put a box in my arms that's too heavy for me to handle and I need to slow it down so I don't drop my, on my foot. That's an eccentric contraction. And then muscles contract in varying ways depending on how other muscles are being contracted. So there's complex interactions among muscles in order to perform actions. So here's some of the terminology that I'm going to be using. Any given muscle can function as what we call an agonist, a primary muscle performing a motion, or an antagonist, opposing the action of another muscle, a synergist, assisting or collaborating with the agonist, helping out the agonist, or a fixator that is stabilizing a joint or other structure so that other muscles, whether they're antagonists or agonists, can contract more efficiently. So I'm just going to um, pause for just a moment and, and, and ask you to think, in this picture of this person put, uh, performing a push-up, which muscles are performing as agonists, which as antagonists, which as synergists, and which as fixators? This is the kind of information that's, that's you know, secondhand, that's totally ingrained in physical therapists, and that helps us. It's not absolutely essential, but it helps us to think in these terms, too, if we're going to do myofascial trigger point needling, or really any technique that involves treating musculoskeletal disorders. Okay. Okay, so here's my answers. Um, the agonist is the triceps. That's the muscle that's extending the elbow to push this person up. 
helped out by the small anconius muscle and also the, the extensor carpi radialis longus, which are performing as uh, assistant to the triceps to extend the elbow. The antagonist, which has to relax in order for this to be done, is the biceps. The biceps would oppose the action of the, of the triceps if it, if it were being contracted. So the biceps has to relax when the, when the triceps contracts. And then finally, we've got some other muscles that are trying to stabilize the shoulder girdle so that this whole operation can be performed efficiently. The serratus anterior and the pectoralis minor stabilize the shoulder blade, and they're serving as fixators. Okay. So, so um, the Jing Jin, as described in Nei Jing Ling Shu Chapter 13, they roughly follow their associated Jing Luo. Uh, they're described as having areas of knotting or tying or binding. What this is is entirely clear in contemporary terminology. It probably refers to uh, tendinous uh, attachments to bone or to joints, uh, uh, fascia, um, aponeuroses. Uh, some muscles do attach to other to fascia rather than directly to bone, um, and those may be the knotting or tying or binding sites that are described in the in the um, Neijing Ling Shu. Uh, some Jingjin have branches. Now, here's a misconception that I want to clear up. This how I was taught in acupuncture school is that the eight extras are the deepest, then the divergence, then the primary, then the um, then the sinew then the wall connecting, and then the most superficial are the tsumai, or the, the skin meridians. Um, don't know where this came from, because when we look at the Neijing Ling Shu, it, that's, and this, or sorry, Su Wen, chapter 43, um, it, it describes something quite different. It puts the Jing Jin at the deepest level, just above the bones, which makes perfect sense when you dissect a cadaver. What's, what's down there deepest? It's the bones and the fascia that attach muscles to them, um, and uh, and then the Jing Luo are embedded within, uh, not deeper than or or lying on top of, for that matter. But they're embedded within, often very deep near the bone, but not always. Um, uh, but they're embedded within the musculature. Okay. Um, so it's when we're treating myofascial structures, we are not doing something trivial or superficial or. I know it's called external medicine. It is different than the internal organs, but it's quite significant clinically uh, what's going on in our musculoskeletal system that affects blood flow, it affects neural function, it affects organ function, and vice versa, right? We're unified organisms, okay? But they don't have their own or distinct shui, um, or caves or holes, I think is a better translation than points, um, because the shui describes something three dimensional. And most body and head shui, of the, the classical acupuncture shui, are located within the, the Jing Jin, within the sinew tracts. Okay? And some have, oops, the bottom of the slide got cut off. Some have indications that include organ symptoms, but mostly they're musculoskeletal symptoms. Okay? So we can spend a lot of time arguing about which Jing Jin does this muscle belong to, um, but here's how I'm going to uh, assign muscles to uh, describe muscles as being part of a specific Jing Jin. Um, if they, if the clinically useful descriptions focus on muscle functions that are primary, frequent, and clinically significant, or distinctive, or unique, or near unique to that muscle, and that are agreed upon and not super controversial, um, rather than their secondary or their uncommon or insignificant or duplicative or controversial functions. Okay. Um, can a muscle belong to more than one Jing Jin? Yes. Things get messy, right? We've got crossover muscles in the body such as the supinator and the pronator teres in, in the forearm, which cross over multiple uh, or involve multiple Jing Jin. Um, there's the erector spinae. When they contract bilaterally, they're an agonist that extend the spine, which is a taiyang Jing Jin function. But when they contract unilaterally, they assist in rotating the spine, which is more of a Xiaoyang uh, function, right? Xiaoyang being the pivot, right? Um, but the erector spinae are most frequently, importantly, contracted bilaterally to maintain upright posture. So it makes more sense to describe them as a Taiyang muscle rather than a Xiaoyang muscle. Uh, the quadratus lumborum, I'd say, is the opposite. Quadratus lumborum is mostly involved in, in um, side bending, a, a Xiaoyang function, uh, being contracted unilaterally. And so it makes more sense to describe it as part of the Xiaoyang, Jingjin. Okay. Um, So there's lots of examples of this. I'm actually going to skip over this slide because I already gave you a couple examples. But here's, here's what we have to remember is that the locations of the, the classical 
uh, xue uh, do not necessarily correspond to the jing jin. The, the jing luo are generally described as distinct and adjacent pathways, but the jing jin may overlap among themselves, right? Um, and the example I just gave you of the, the erector spinae and the quadratus lumborum, um, yes, you can, you can access the quadratus lumborum by needling deeply into bladder meridian points, okay? Um, the distinction is the depth and the distinction is the function, okay? So um, I'm going to skip the rest of the slide for a graphic that makes it a little bit clearer, okay? So look at kidney 9 on the left of the slide there. Uh, kidney 9 on the surface seems to be located in the soleus. That's our entry point, uh, sorry, gastrocnemius or gastrocnemius and soleus. You're going to go through the, the combined uh, posterior superficial compartment when you needle deeply into kidney 9, okay? Um, but it's, it's very clear structurally and functionally that the gastroc and soleus and the Achilles tendon are all part of the Tai Yang Jing Jin. They're superficial, they're posterior, and they function only essentially as plantar flexors, uh, which is a Tai Yang motion. Okay? But what we can do with deep kneeling in kidney 9 is we can get into the Xiao Yin Jing Jin, the deep posterior compartment, uh, the flexor digitorum longus, the tibialis posterior. Now, we have to be careful how we do this, and I'm going to talk about that later. Um, we need to avoid the neurovascular bundle, and I don't recommend, actually, in some sense, this is a slightly a, a misleading slide. It's great for didactic purposes for me to explain the difference between the surface location of the points and what we want to do with needling, but there's actually a risk of needling into that deep posterior compartment. It's actually one of the, pretty much the only muscle that I say is contraindicated to needle is the tibialis posterior, and I'll explain why later. Okay. But I hope you get my point here that, that uh, where the point is on the surface of the body doesn't necessarily correspond to what Jing Jin lie underneath it and what we can treat. Okay? So there are yang tissues in the Jing Jin that are under voluntary control. Uh, and our ancient classical descriptions of the Jing Jin involve muscles whose contraction and relaxation result in motion or stabilization. Muscles, tendons, aponeuroses, and fascia. Uh, the common denominator is that we are in, we can voluntarily move them or control them. Okay, there's also the yin tissues, and that's our subject for tomorrow. Uh, with ligamentous proloacupuncture, we'll be needling into yin tissues, which are involuntary support structures. Um, and this is this may be what is being described by the uh, the knotting or the binding points. Um, and this is where muscles attach to and move, but they're not directly under conscious control. I can't decide to make my bones or my ligaments or my joints or menisci or discs or my intramuscular septi move independently of my muscles. I can't say, luckily, I want my tibia to pop out of my calf, right? So they're not under voluntary control. But they're not passive or inert or non-contractile. Those are misconceptions. Um, bones are highly metabolically active and constantly remodeling, and ligaments contract slightly when stimulated, and that's the basis of what we do with ligamentous proacupuncture. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, but you can read it at some point. This is direct out of the um, uh, acupuncture comprehensive text, often referred to as the Shanghai text from Shanghai Medical University, translated by Bensky and O'Connor back in the 70s. Great text, I think, one of my favorite acupuncture texts. And there's a very detailed description of exactly what the, a modern description of the Jing Jin. And I've been kind of giving you my, my summary here. Okay. Um, so there are both ancient and contemporary Chinese methods of acupuncture that, that do something analogous here, where we palpate along uh, a pathway to determine where to needle. There's Richard Stan's balance method that I'm sure many of you practice. There's Dr. Wang Juyi's channel palpation. Uh, I had the good fortune of studying with Dr. Wang Juyi for a little while when he taught at the Five Branches University some uh, 20 years ago. Um, and the emphasis here, though, is more on the Jing Luo. Um, and, um, but I, I just want to make that point that the idea of palpating along a channel uh, to find uh, locations that you needle are, uh, is an uh, a, um, uh, ancient and contemporary method within Chinese medicine as well. Okay? And finally, another little terminological definition. If I refer to dry needling, what I'm basically saying is using a needle without injection. Um, and depending on how we describe this, this could include acupuncture or acupuncture could include dry needling. I'm going to say there's overlap, but there's also some differences. And some of these techniques, motor, uh, motor point needling or motor zone needling, ligament, tendon, joint, and neural prolo needling, myofascial trigger point needling, these are all forms of dry needling and arguably forms of acupuncture. 
but they're different from the, the um, use of the classical acupuncture locations We're using moxa, lasers, herbs, etc., and the various lineages that we have that tell us where to go with those tools. Okay. So let's start making this a little more clinical. What does all this add to our treatment of dorsolateral elbow pain? Uh, this is a, uh, an example that I uh, like to use because it's probably the best place if you haven't already practiced uh, myofascial trigger point needling and want to get started, um, or if you do practice it but you want to practice some more, practice on yourself. It's a very safe area. It's a very easy to access area. It's commonly symptomatic, particularly in our keyboard society. Um, and, um, and there are some things that we can learn from a myofascial trigger point approach that are different than what we might find if we, if we just stuck to the time-tested trails of uh, classical acupuncture points. Okay? So, so let's review this a little bit, and then um, uh, we're going to experiment with using um, a, the camera on the MacBook and with my assistant Jason helping me to see if, if you can watch me um, uh, do some uh, trigger point kneeling on my own forearm. Okay? If this turns out to be too clumsy or difficult, uh, I might instead um, I either do it on Jason or I might do it on my own calf or something where I can pull up my, my, uh, my leggings and uh, my pants and um, use both hands, which is, of course, generally how we needle in clinical practice. So we're, this is where I have to apologize for, for not being in a, in a studio, being in my living room with uh, just one person, but I'm very appreciative of Jason's help and his presence here. So, okay, so before we start doing that uh, practical demonstration, um, so how might we approach treating a patient who complains of dorsolateral elbow pain, tennis elbow, lateral epicondylitis, forearm extensor tendinosis? Okay. So there's the classical approach, um, the most ancient approach, which is to you know, palpate along the Jing Jin, probably be looking at primarily the arm Yang Ming and the arm Xiao Yang, um, and kneeling into tender locations. Okay. Um, in contemporary TCM, we might choose locations such as uh, local ones like large intestine 10, 11, and 12, or the extra point Chu Yang Wei, outer elbow Yang, uh, right at the epicondyle. We might pick some adjacent points like triple warmer 8, 9, or 10, and we might use some distal points like large intestine 4 or triple warmer 5, and we might go all the way for practicing, you know, Master Dong style or Richard Tan style or Kiko Matsumoto. We might be needling locations on the other limbs as well, okay? Uh, we might uh, add in locations to treat any Zong Fu or Ba Gong or Xie Qi disharmonies that we identify in our history and physical exam. Okay? And yes, this can work. Of course it can work. Um, but here's some things that we might not find, and, and by treating these, we might be able to help with those stubborn cases of tennis elbow. And I've certainly had plenty. Tennis elbow used to defeat me uh, more often than I'd like to admit when I was just using uh, uh, classical acupuncture points alone and maybe just doing some gua sha or some massage. Okay? But this helped me a lot to understand that there are some specific muscles that are the main, very often the main symptom generators and that require some special needling techniques to reduce trigger points. And the first one, uh, probably the most important, is the, the, uh, the, the uh, extensor carpi group, but particularly the radialis longus. Okay? So don't worry, I'm gonna, I've got a slide where I'm going to show you where the anatomy is. And you know, for those of you that don't remember that from your undergrad classes, but um, extensor carpi radialis longus is a, uh, uh, a wrist and forearm extensor that um, will produce pain radiating to the dorsal radial side of the hand. And it's very involved in gripping and grasping. And um, uh, other muscles that are very important here, um, the extensor digitorum superficialis, the superficial wrist and finger extensor, um, <clears throat> the supinator, um, and let's see, somehow, I'm sorry, the bullet points got slightly altered some, somehow in translation from my PowerPoint to the eLotus format here. So that number two should be large there. And the, the bullet point just underneath it, middle or ring finger extension, shows painful weakness. That's a, that's a hallmark of extensor digitorum superficialis. Okay? Number three, uh, the supinator is a deep muscle in the dorsal form, which is often a hidden contributor, but a very significant one. To, um, to lateral elbow pain. And then finally, uh, 
in Western medicine, we used to think the brachial radialis is the main actor here. It's not, uh, I think by general agreement now, it is an occasional aggravator, but it's not really the primary muscle involved. Uh, but it's relatively easy to access on the surface. Okay. Um, so before we start looking at some of these trigger point charts, I want to just uh, um, actually you know, tell you what, I'm going to skip this slide. You can reference it later if you're having trouble interpreting these charts. But here's the chart itself Okay, for the extensor carpi radialis longus, our most important muscle when treating dorsolateral elbow pain. So what I want to draw your attention to, first of all, is the, the image on the right, which has um, the muscle itself. The, 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 you've got two arms. This, the arm where the muscle itself is displayed with a little white X in it. And then the image on uh, to, the, to the right of that, where we see what its preferred pain pattern is when it has a myofascial trigger point in it. Um, so you'll see there that uh, there's a black X there, and I'm, again, I'm going to say ignore the X's, focus on the referred pain pattern, and what you'll see from that is that the pain is uh, felt by most people most of the time right at the lateral elbow. Now, the, those, the little dots there, the, the denser the dots does not mean the more severe the pain, it means the more common that site is uh, likely to show pain in a patient who has a trigger point in their extensor carpi radialis longus. So most commonly, it's felt at the lateral elbow, but also quite commonly down around the radial dorsal wrist and thumb and forefinger, kind of in the uh, large intestine four and um, uh, the extra point jonquil of that area. Okay, And then less commonly, it's felt along the, uh, the dorsal forearm. Okay. Other information in these slides here, I'm, I'm assigning this arm, uh, this muscle to the arm Yang Ming Jing Jin. Um, I'm, just, I'm giving you something in regards to its depth. It's deep to the extensor digitorum superficialis, but it's superficial to the extensor carpi radialis brevis, the short uh, one joint muscle that lies underneath the extensor carpi radialis longus. The ECRL is a two joint muscle crossing both the elbow and the wrist. Um, I'm giving you the attachments of the muscle, the lateral epicondyle versus the common extensor tendon. All the extensor muscles bundle into one tendon that attaches to the lateral epicondyle. And the distal attachment, the dorsal radial surface of the second metacarpal. That's where this muscle attaches distally. And its primary function is to extend the hand uh, or extend the wrist, and secondarily to, to radially deviate it and also to assist in elbow flexion. And then finally, I'm giving you just a, a, a uh, summary uh, brief guide to uh, the depth and sometimes the angle in which we need to, to insert the needle in order to, uh, to release trigger points in this muscle. So to get to the extensor carpi radialis longus, we're going to needle perpendicularly to an intermediate depth. Okay? Um, so that's that muscle. And what I want to do now is I'm going to leave that slide up there and then uh, Jason and I are going to see if we can, can make this work here with me um, needling my own elbow. Um, and I'm thinking here, Jason, why don't we unplug my laptop and <clears throat> I'm going to hand this to you to use as the camera. And I'm going to open up my kit here. Now I can I can pretty much guarantee you that I've got a, a, a trigger point in my uh, ECRL in my left <clears throat> arm because um, last uh, uh, a few months ago I really flared it up. I can't remember what I was doing. I think I was weightlifting in the gym or something, and I felt this sudden kind of like tightening up and clenching in that in the forearm on that side, and it was quite painful for a couple for a you know a good couple weeks or so. And uh, but this is one of the techniques I use to treat it myself. So okay. Yeah, okay, that looks like that displays okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so here on the surface is the, that muscle that just popped out here when I, I um, uh, flexed my elbow um, with my forearm pronated. This is the brachial radialis, and then also on the surface is the extensor digitorum superficialis. 
um, that those muscles can both be kind of pinched up and grasped here. Brachial radialysis is back here posteriorly, um, and I'm not sure if, let me, let me roll my sleeve up a little bit more. Okay, that's brachial radialis there. This is on the surface is extensor digitorum superficialis. There's superficial fascia. Just underneath it is extensor digitorum superficialis. But my goal is underneath, the, underneath this bundle, you can see that bulging up. Underneath that, that's the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis contracting. Okay? So if I go really deep, I'll get into brevis, but my, I'm going to go for an intermediate depth. Okay? So anatomy gets me into a general area, but then the real key here is I have to start palpating. Okay? So I'm going to take my fingers, and this is the palpatory method that I'm going to use for the majority of muscles, um, and I'm going to run them back and forth along the, the, uh, the fiber orientation, perpendicular to the fiber orientation. Okay? So the fiber orientation is up and down the forearm like this, distal to proximal, proximal to distal. Okay? So I'm going perpendicular back and forth, and what I'm looking for is a taut fibrous band. And so some parts of the muscle are more flexible. That's more flexible there. That's a little more flexible there, but right about there, and you may be able to see there how when I strum my finger across the string, you can see a line jumping up and down my forearm. Can you see that okay? I hope you can. I th it looks like it's displaying okay in the monitor. So that's a fibrous band compared to here. See, when I, when I push here, I mean, you can see the, the tissue jiggle a little bit locally, but you don't see a clear, distinct line or band that, that is being kind of strummed or plucked up and down the forearm. Can you see that difference between squishy here that just kind of moves things in a circle here versus there is a band there that makes a line pop out going along my forearm. Okay? So that tells me there's a taut band of muscle tissue that's somewhat contracted there. And then what I want to do is find within that a, a tender or grainy or tight node that particularly if it reproduces any of my typical symptoms. And I'm actually glad to find that my form is a lot better off than it was a few months ago. <laughs> because I can tell you a few months ago, I would have no trouble at all finding exactly where that really painful trigger point was. But this is probably the most tender spot right there. So the real bullseye is if I find the spot that when I press on it, it reproduces my typical symptoms. Not just tender, not just pain, but my typical symptoms. Um, the pain is often, I'll ask the patient, is that the pain that you've been feeling or just tender or just painful? And, and usually they'll be able to tell me. They'll say, yeah, that's it. That's the pain, um, or at least a pain, a very significant pain that I've been feeling. Okay, so that feels right there. That's different than down here or up here. Right here, when I strum across, there's a thicker, grainier nodule right there. And I can feel it radiating up and down along that pathway rather than just locally tender. So that's what I want to look for. Okay? Now, um, my wife, who practices a lot of Kiko Matsumoto acupuncture, says, oh, yeah, that's one of Kiko's immune system points. Like, Great. Good. Uh, we can measure it out and say, well, that happens to be, it's not quite large intestine 10, and it's not quite triple warmer 9 or... Uh, so, in terms of TCM, I don't, you know, we could argue about it, but, but rather than finding this through, through sun measurements and through classical um, descriptions of point locations, I'm really finding it by palpation, right? Okay, so I think that's fairly clear. So, I'm running my finger back and forth across it. Actually, it's starting to get less tender as I do that, so I'm going to stop so I don't lose it. Now, in a really nasty trigger point of the sort that your patients are going to complain about, rubbing back and forth like this, it'll probably typically stay tender until you needle into it or you do a good 10, 15 minutes worth of cross-fiber massage. Okay. So I'm going to do this one-handed, which, as I said, is not how I would do it on a patient. But I've got here a 50-millimeter 30-gauge needle, and we're going to talk about needle gauges and, uh, and lengths shortly. Okay. But I prefer a stiff needle. Okay, and I'm needling in, and then I'm going to fish around, and what I'm searching for is something there. Now I feel a burning, aching sensation that is not just local, it radiates up and down my elbow and, and actually there it is. I just felt it right down here at Hagu. Um, I could feel exactly that referred pain pattern of extensor carpi radialis longus. So I had to fish around a little bit to feel it and, and now it's really aching and 
quite strongly up to the lateral elbow too, uh, which is so it's it's I've kind of hit the spot where I'm getting both the 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 two most common sites of ECRL referred pain, and the pathway along them is starting to feel kind of lit up. Okay, and there I just felt a subtle twitch response, which probably wasn't visible. But if I keep needling like this, I'm probably going to get a larger twitch response, which may be visible on the camera. Um, and we're going to talk about exactly what those are. Oh, there. Okay, now I got a really strong achy sensation. And and I want to fish for the most there. That spot now, I feel the entire pathway really strongly lit up. So you kind of have to fish around for these a little bit, which is, I believe, my understanding of what was described in a lot of the classical acupuncture te um, texts as the sensation of a fish biting a hook. That's exactly what it feels like. I feel... Uh, at both ends, because I'm needling it to myself, but I feel like something just grabbed the needle and there's a little bite on it, okay? Um, now, um, if it gets to the point where it's like uh, the patient starts complaining, that's too sore, that's too achy, I need a break, no problem. We just take a break, okay? And a lot of times, simply by needle leaving that needle in place for, you know, even just a couple of minutes, um, the achiness will subside and you can resume needling um, or you can leave it in longer, 15-20 um, minutes and the sensation may just resolve, the, the trigger point may just unwind and resolve on its own. So you've got a lot of flexibility and options here for working with your patient. Um, the patients that like, they only tolerate one, one moment of strong achy sensation, they only tolerate one twitch response and then they just want to lie there still on the table or Maybe you do some distal needling or some massage or whatever. That's fine. That'll work well, too. you got the patient who is eager to get as much done as they can in a, sh a short amount of time, and they just like, ah, just keep going. I don't mind the pain. Okay, no problem. I'll just keep going. I'll keep needling away. And what I'm looking for is um, for the trigger point to, that you've heard me use the term a bunch, reduce. What does that mean? It means um, that it stops twitching and it stops hurting. That's basically it. Um, now, it may, it may continue, there may continue to be some residual soreness, but the really strong, kind of nasty, like, ouch, uh, I mean, it hurts good. Patients will say, yeah, that hurts good, like deep tissue massage, um, but it's a, it's a strong sensation that that really subsides, and that there might be a little residual achiness, but they're not feeling a, a really strong sensation, and it stops twitching. And that's when I know that that trigger point is reduced. Not every patient will tolerate that in a single session. But, um, but again, this is just where the conversation with the patient is so important. Um, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll ask the patient, I'll inform the patient before we even start. I'll say, okay, this is going to be, this may be more uncomfortable than you're used to with acupuncture if you've had acupuncture of a different style before. Um, so let's just have a conversation uh, when it, when it, really reproduces your symptoms and really makes it ache and hurt, that tells me I'm in a clinically significant location. And if a patient is kind of skeptical about that, I can say, well, we can verify this. I'll pick some really non-tender location in a part of your body that doesn't hurt. And, you know, I'll just, you know, obviously with safety considerations in mind, I will put a needle into that location and, and they'll, sure, they'll feel the prick as it goes through the skin. But that might be it. Right? And I can probe around and not elicit much. And that's that sensation we have when we put a needle into a tissue and it just feels like it's kind of going into warm butter or honey or molasses or something. It's easy to manipulate, no resistance, not much dochi, not much sensation. The patient doesn't feel it that much. That may be very appropriate for treating some other kinds of disorders, but it's not going to work to reduce the myofascial trigger point. And, <clears throat> and so I'll explain to the patient the discomfort that you're feeling is an indication of the severity of the trigger point is proportionate to the degree of inflammation and adhesion and uh, 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 the, uh, the physiology of the trigger point determines how uncomfortable it is. Not anything particular I'm doing. I'm sure, yes, I can amplify that by needling really strong and really fast and hard. I can minimize that by needling subtly. But the basic uh, sensation of tenderness and referred pain is going to be determined by the trigger point. And most patients, most of the time, I, I find will understand that and embrace that. And if they don't, it's just not the right technique for them. I'll just try something else. But here I'm going to probe around. And now it actually does feel a lot less tender than it did when I inserted the needle a couple of minutes ago. I'm not getting anything in the way of a twitch, twitch response. 
So my options are I can keep fishing around and see if maybe, you know, the trigger points can be small, they can be large, they can be pinpoint, they can be the size of a quarter. Um, and so a good approach is to, you know, again, as tolerated by the patient, kind of go around the clock, okay, and just, just angle into all areas. But you can either do it kind of uh, the complete way of just literally going around the clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, until you complete the circuit. Um, but often there's certain parts of that that just aren't all that interesting and nothing. I didn't find anything 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. When I get to 6 o'clock, bang, there it is. Now I found a, plot, a spot that's still really tender. Um, and so what I've learned to do with practice is to feel for resistance. Resistance is a good indicator of where there is unreduced um, trigger point uh, still present in the muscle. Something that's resistant that instead of feeling like honey or butter, it feels like uh, like old dried oatmeal or or um, dried chewing gum or uh, kind of grainy, like it's got little seeds in it or something like that, a little sand in it. Um, though it is, sometimes even feels crunchy, like you're needling into styrofoam, which is a very bizarre feeling to encounter in human tissue, but I encounter it all the time. And those, that's where we're going to find our clinically significant trigger points. Now, a couple other aspects of this needling technique, okay. Um, the, the best technique when you want to change angle is to withdraw to fairly near the surface. You don't want to bend the needle in there. Um, so, I'm going to with, so I'm just going to be a little more careful and deliberate in how I do this so that I'm modeling and demonstrating what I really want for you all to consider and practice. Is withdraw to near the surface, change angle, and without bending the needle, insert at a different angle. Okay? And that way I'm more likely to find something I didn't find with the first probe or first insertion. Um, and that's what we have to do if we say we, we palpate and we think we found a trigger point, but then we didn't really get much response by our first angle of needle insertion. Is uh, make the fi Your fingers probably weren't wrong. Your palpatory fingers were probably accurate, but you just need to change the needle angle by with partially withdrawing and coming in at a different angle until you find something. So that angle there doesn't do anything. This angle here, I still have a part of the trigger point that's unreduced when I needle around 6 o'clock. That seems to be the stubborn area, and maybe 7 o'clock too. Yeah. But overall, it's really starting to feel better now, and I'm not feeling the referred pain anymore. And now I can manipulate the needle around fairly rapidly without much discomfort. And the, the referred pain sensation has largely subsided. So I'm going to say, okay, that, that trigger point seems like, oh, I just found another area. So I've also learned that the magic words <laughs> to find uh, part of the trigger point that is still active is to say to the patient, well, it seems like we've reduced all the, that trigger point and it's not twitching anymore. And then usually, bang, that's when I get the next big twitch, okay? So don't be surprised if that happens, okay? But... Um, I think I've uh, illustrated this well enough to withdraw this needle, and I'm going to find my sharps container here. And then I'm just going to just check our schedule here because I want to be sure I don't overrun our break time, uh, which is... Uh, 10.30, if I understand correctly, Donna, we're going to take a break then. So uh, if you want to correct me, Donna, if I got that wrong, please do so. But um, okay, so um, that's extensor carpi radialis longus. So I'm going to pause there and, and, um, and take a look at any questions that anyone wants to type in uh, about. I'm going to, I, for right now, I just want to keep it fairly specific to that muscle and that needling technique, um, and we can revisit larger questions later, okay? Okay, I see a bunch of you are typing. Again, this is kind of an ideal um, muscle to practice on yourself, or an ideal region to practice on yourself, because as you can see, you really can do it freehand with one hand. Um, And yes, we'll go on a, a break after a little bit of Q&A. Um, and so 10.30 is a good time for us to take a break, right? And at, uh, yeah, okay. 
So somebody asked, radiating to middle finger is the wrong muscle. Uh, it, it's a different muscle. It's extensor digitorum superficialis. Okay. How long do you keep stimulating? There isn't a precise answer to this. Again, it's, it's, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, I will answer that question in more detail. I think I addressed it just now in the practicum, but I'll, I'll get into that in more detail later. Okay. Um, yes, good question. Uh, what would I expect for healthy outcome in kneeling a patient who's willing to accept discomfort? Um, I would expect that, um, <clears throat> that it's going to be sore um, probably for the remainder of the day, likely into the next day. Sometimes the next day is the worst. Day two, it should start feeling better. If it goes on for more than two or three days, that's a puzzle. That's extremely rare, um, and I don't have a good answer for that. And it probably won't happen again, and it's probably mediated mostly by psychosocial or emotional factors or a re-injury of the trigger point, nothing to do with the acupuncture itself. Okay. Um, so, um, so that's a general answer for that. Um, somebody asked about, um, oh, and relief. Well, relief will occur when the soreness subsides. Uh, in, in a funny way, patients often say it feels better even though it feels really sore. They can tell that something good happened, that blood is slowing again, even though there's some local soreness. Okay. Um, let's see, other questions that came up here. How do you avoid bruising? You know the local vascular anatomy and you avoid major blood vessels. And sure, occasionally, just as with any form of acupuncture, you might hit a little arteriole or a little venule and get a little subcutaneous hematoma and I just reassure patients that that'll resolve on its own. Okay. Um, so, let's see. Uh, somebody asked, what, how do I, for other healthcare providers, how do I explain what is happening physiologically when you do myofascial trigger point needling? Um, if we have time, we'll get into that. I've got, oh, a dozen or more slides at the end of the, 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 uh, the slide handout that you will have access to that have uh, some of the anatomy and physiology. Um, other questions here. <clears throat> um, let's see. Any neural anatomy to avoid in the area? Um, this area, not so much. There is the radial nerve. Um, it's a uh, mostly a, a, it's a sensory and motor nerve that, or sensory and motor branches. Um, so, but this is a, is a good important question. If if we so the myopain seminars taught to physical therapists emphasized um, avoiding nerves. Um, that is probably a way to avoid a uh, a hurts bad kind of pain where you get a little flash of discomfort radiating down the nerve pathway. Um, however, a few years ago I had the distinct pleasure of um, taking in the course, I'm, I myself am a student uh, in the, um, the Doctorate of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine program at the Academy of Chinese Culture and Health Sciences and we had uh, the instructor Clayton Shu come teach um, uh, a uh, class on um, the Xing Nao Kai Chao technique, uh, which has become famous through the 9,000 Needles documentary about the, uh, the, the um, teacher at Tianjin Medical Hospital uh, who made it famous through you know, stroke rehab. And uh, Clayton Shu uh, did his whole PhD. He's Chinese American, but spent four years in China doing his PhD there and now teaches. They're excellent seminars, excellent technique. And here's the, here's the kicker. They involve deliberately eliciting nerve sensations in a careful and controlled way. And when I look at the, the uh, Du Qi descriptions in the Shanghai um, uh, text, the acupuncture comprehensive text, a lot of them are very clearly contact or with or stimulation of a nerve pathway. Okay? They describe a numb, tingly sensation radiating in a certain direction. It's like that matches the pathway of the sciatic nerve or the radial nerve. So I have become much less concerned about mild, brief stimulation of nerves. Now, we don't want to traumatize nerves. So this is how I explain this to patients is uh, when I'm fishing around for a trigger point, you may feel a brief, sudden electrical zing that feels very different than the achy soreness of the trigger point, a little tingle that shoots down to your fingers or your toes. Uh, if that happens, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's going to be, it's, it's uncomfortable, I understand. Just let me know. And it's actually therapeutic for the nerve in small doses. It's Goldilocks. You want to get a little bit of stimulation of it. You don't want to traumatize it. You don't want to injure it. You're probably, Clayton and I have talked about this extensively, 
as far as he can tell, we're not that sensation is elicited not actually by puncturing into the nerve. It's simply the nerve sheath or even a fluid shock wave created by the, the manipulation of the needle that, that generates a nerve sensation. And that's all we need. And it actually can be, I've, I've had, uh, since learning his technique and using it, have seen some really excellent results with uh, stroke, traumatic brain injuries, and nerve damage that otherwise were just defying my practice. So, so I am no longer concerned about a brief mild stimulation of a nerve, but I do want to know where they are and how not to traumatize them. Okay. Um, so uh, another question with needling, are you looking for radiation of achy sensation along the trigger point pathway or the patient's typical pain? Both. Typical pain is the best, but I'll take any referred pain pattern I can get. And I've got a slide later on that, that illustrates that. Okay. Um, other questions? Um, to be clear, are you saying continue manipulating unless there's no twitching or response? Yes, if tolerated. Um, no, if not tolerated. Okay, it just depends on your patient and depends on your rapport with your patient. Can you needle more than one point? Yes, you can, absolutely. I don't rec recommend that much needling more than one at the same time in the same muscle because if you get a really powerful muscle twitch um, out of one needle and you have other needles embedded in it, um, I have not had this, well, actually I've had this happen in one muscle, the erector spinae group. Uh, so just particularly don't do that in the erector spinae because you can bend a needle. I once bent a whole series of needles that way and had trouble extracting them very painfully and was just relieved at the end of it when I didn't have to refer the patient for uh, you know needle removal surgery. Okay, so that muscle in particular, the erector spinae, don't insert multiple needles and and do trigger needling in all of them at once. Um, but you can insert, you can do trigger needling in one muscle and give it a break and go to a different muscle and do trigger needling in that muscle. Just be aware of the potential for a significant jump or twitch to to affect other muscles. Uh, somebody asked, does it feel like delayed onset muscle soreness afterwards? Yeah, that's exactly, and that's, in, that's probably what it is, except that it's not delayed. It's happening right away. But it's a very similar sensation to what's called delayed onset muscle soreness, which is the, the normal uh, muscle soreness that we all experience after a strong workout when we really use a muscle. And uh, it feels like about a day later, it starts feeling sore, achy, and tired. And then it feels pretty good afterwards, and it feels strong and functional. So that's what I tell patients. It's basically, it's not delayed, but it's the exact same sensation it's the, and, and similar physiology as far as we can tell. And, and that means also that it'll go away on its own and that the same things can be used to alleviate. Uh, light massage, moist heat, light exercise, and just the knowledge that's going to go away on its own. Okay. Um, how is the pain different from hitting a nerve? I think um, if, you, if a dentist has ever drilled into a nerve in your tooth and compare that to a, a, a body worker putting their elbow into a tight muscle in your gluteal, they are completely different sensations. There is no mistaking one for the other. Nerve is shock-like, instantaneous, electrical, sharp, burning zing. Um, myofascial trigger is dull, achy, sometimes a little burning, but kind of more warm and uh, it doesn't come on rapidly or go away rapidly. Okay? We're going to talk about how to combine it with e-stim and other techniques. Uh, how, how long on average? There is no average. I mean, it, I mean, I've spent 45 minutes on one very stubborn trigger point in the quadratus lumborum. I've put a needle in, and in, in literally the first insertion, bang, got a big twitch, and it's gone. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Uh, somebody asking about the brand of needle I prefer. This is the last question I'm going to answer before I take a break. Uh, now, I first have to do the caveat that as a uh, CEU provider, I'm not allowed to endorse any specific brand, and so I'm not endorsing any particular brand. But I'm going to say in general that the silicone-coated, super painless, slick, smooth needles don't work as well for this because they don't grasp the tissue as well. They're more comfortable and less effective, so it's a trade-off. Um, the rougher, cheaper needles that engage the tissue are, are more effective. Um, but here's the other thing is I also want a needle that's stiff. A flexible needle doesn't work very well for this in my experience because you can't guide it into. It'll bend rather than going into the really dense, tight areas of, of resistance that characterize a, a trigger point. Okay? So that means either larger gauge or a different brand, and some brands are more flexible than others, okay? and some are stiffer than others. All right. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pause now. Um, we're all going to take a 15-minute break, and then uh, we'll resume at 10.45. So thank you very much for your attention.